I'm Phil Ware, and this is Together. Today, our Together is focused on interrupting the silence of foolishness. And it comes from 1 Corinthians 1.18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now, hang on, I promise, this is a resurrection message with lots of joy. But to get to the joy, we have to journey with Jesus through the passion. And we join the disciples after Jesus has been crucified and buried by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. And they are devastated. They still love Jesus, but they're shattered by the shame and the curse of the cross and the death of their master. And they thought the master would be the Messiah, but he was crucified. And and they had seen the horrendous things done to him, his body abused, stuck on a pole, nailed to the cross, naked like a uh, the worst of the, the criminals that Rome executed. But, but they still loved him. And they still knew there had to be something more, and yet their hope was gone. Even when they heard of others that had seen Jesus like the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they couldn't believe. And those disciples on the road to Emmaus even said, we had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel because they had no expectation of a resurrected, crucified Messiah. Even when the women that had met Jesus at the tomb and knew he was raised, they couldn't believe them. They were caught in the impenetrable silence, the impenetrable silence that left them lost and bewildered and devastated. That's because this impenetrable silence was an impenetrable silence of fear. They were in a locked room hiding so they didn't lose their lives. It was an impenetrable silence of defeat because they had seen their master so destroyed physically, berated emotionally, questioned spiritually. It was also an impenetrable silence of failure. They knew they had let him down. They had promised that they would stick with him, even if it cost them their lives. But the disciples, despite their promises at the Last Supper, forsook him and fled when he was arrested. Peter, even though he was warned, denied Jesus three times. So of the twelve, one betrayed him, one denied him three times, and the other ten ran away. They were also in the impenetrable silence of disappointment. They had dreams. They had left their jobs. They had been fishermen and tax collectors. They had been all sorts of professions, and they had given those up to follow Jesus. For three and a half years, they had left everything, and now it was a waste and gone. But most of all, they were lost in the impenetrable silence of foolishness. At first glance, for those of us who are Christians, we have no idea why this is foolishness, why they saw Jesus, the Messiah, being crucified as foolishness, or at least their foolishness. So we have to do a little digging. And you have to understand the phrase, Staros to Christu, the cross of Christ. Those were unspeakable words. They weren't words that you would ever use together in the same sentence if you were a good Jew. In Deuteronomy, we find Moses telling Israel that anyone who hung on a pole is under God's curse. Jesus was hung on a pole. He was under God's curse curse. And in case we doubt that, in Galatians 3, Paul even talks about that curse, that Jesus took on the curse of the cross for us to deliver us into freedom. 
So yes, staros to Christu was an unspeakable thing. It was crazy. It was blasphemous. And for Gentiles, it was absolute foolishness because no masterful leader would ever be crucified and then followed after his crucifixion and humiliation. Paul said, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Yes, it's a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Why? Why could Paul say this? Because God interrupted the silence of foolishness with resurrection. Remember the story? The women come to the tomb and they meet Jesus. They're excited and he tells them to go witness of his resurrection, testify to the other disciples. But they didn't believe them at first. But Peter and John run to the tomb. They peer in and they even get to see the resurrected Jesus. How important was that to them? It changed everything. As Peter writes the letter of 1 Peter, the first nine verses are just filled with this rapturous language of what happens to Peter's heart and to every Christian's heart when they realize that the crucified Messiah is now resurrected. He says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So the women had seen the resurrection Jesus. The disciples on the road to Emmaus were about to see the resurrected Jesus. Peter and John had run to see the empty tomb and met the resurrected Jesus, but the rest of the apostles were unbelieving. They just couldn't believe it. And then Jesus joined them. He came into their presence and he said, peace be with you. And then because they disbelieved for joy, Luke tells us, Jesus says, hey guys, what's that you're eating there? Yeah, that fish. Well, give me a piece of that fish. And he ate it in front of them. And he said, look, a ghost doesn't eat fish. I'm raised from the dead. I am living among you. And they believed. You see, all of a sudden, everything changed from the deepest despair to the glorious, rapturous assurance that all was not lost, but it had just begun because God defeated the power of death for us through the cross and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. Death was defeated. Hope was restored. Life was assured because Jesus lives. Because God interrupted the silence of foolishness. And he took what was foolish and hideous in the cross. And he made it a sacrifice of grace voluntarily given to give us life. And the reason that we can know that life is ours is because Jesus lives. And so we turn back to our verse of the day and we say with confidence, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. That power of God is available to you. Jesus said we could confess him in front of other people, other human beings, and he would confess us before the Father in heaven. So if you have never done so, please confess before other people that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and you claim him as your Savior and you want him to be your Lord. Secondly, 
we've emphasized through this journey with Jesus through the cross and on to the resurrection, that the gospel, according to 1 Corinthians 15, the gospel by which we are saved, is centered in three critical events that happen during this incredible week. Jesus dies on the cross, and he is buried in a borrowed tomb. And he is raised from the dead on Resurrection Sunday. And Jesus says, not only can you honor me by being baptized, but you can join me in the good news story. Because when you are baptized by someone confessing me as your Lord and Savior, you share with me in my death. You crucify the old life and you bury it, and it's gone. You're buried with Christ, and you're raised to walk a new life, and your life is joined with his. And Colossians 3, 1 through 4 says, your life is now hidden with Christ in God, and when Christ, who is your life, appears, you will share with him in glory. So yes, dear friend, the message of the cross may be foolishness to those who are perishing, But to us who are being saved, it is the power of the living God. And I invite you to live by that power today.